There's that. Willie, it's happening. Well, finally. Finally. How you doing, buddy? Good, and yourself? Yeah, I'm great. I'm great. Let me close this door, hold it. Certainly. All right, what you been up to? Um, just kind of, uh, uh, so I moved out to the desert here in Palm Desert, California. Oh, yeah? Oh. yeah. And, uh, you know, just figuring out the next chapter of my life. I've been in corporate media for too long, Willie. Is it, uh, yeah. Where's on you? So I'm, I'm striking out on my own and it's going well so far. Good, yeah. good, congratulations. Yeah, thanks, buddy. All right, um, you wanna get started? Hey, let's do it. All right. Excuse me. Yeah, no problem. All right. I just had to get my wiper glasses. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Let's make sure my mic levels are good. Okay. Uh, so quite a background there, by the way. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> a little bit of brewing stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Willie Ari, uh, one thing that I found fascinating is that you played for the Bruins in 1958. Yes, two games. First, first black NHL player of all time. Yes. You beat the Red Sox by a year. <laughs> a whole year? Oh. How, how insane is that? Pumpsy Russell was the, or yeah. Pumpsy Green was the, the first player to ever play for the Red Sox. Um, you, you, how surprising is it to you to learn that, that you were a, a black hockey player in Boston before they had a black baseball player? Yeah, well, well you know, when I, uh, when I turned pro with the Quebec Aces in, in, in 1956, they had a working agreement with, uh, with the Bruins. And uh, I went to the Bruins training camp in 57 and in 1958, you know, and um, I really felt great about, you know, going to an NHL training camp. Um, when they, uh, in 1958, uh, they, they, you know, they called me up to play two games against the Montreal Canadiens. And uh, January the 18th was a Saturday uh, in Montreal. I played my first NHL game. I had played against the Montreal Canadiens in exhibition games, but this was a regular scheduled NHL game. Right. Um, we were very fortunate. We beat Canadians uh, three nothing. We shut them out. It was a Saturday night. Uh, it was just a, a feat in itself. And then, uh, you know, we went to Boston on Sunday, and uh, the Canadians beat us. And then I come back to Quebec. But uh, you know, I, I didn't realize, Zach. I didn't realize that I had broke the uh, the color barrier uh, until I read it in the paper. I was just so excited about getting to play in an mm. NHL regular regular season game and. Uh, it was great. I, uh, my mom and dad came up from my hometown. My brother came up and four or five of my close friends came up and uh, they were just so excited. When you talk about your hometown, are you talking about Fredericton? Fredericton, New Brunswick. I'm a Maritimer. Oh, Freddie Beach boy. <laughs> <laughs> Been reading a lot about Fredericton and uh -huh. the people that love there seem to absolutely thoroughly enjoy it and would live <laughs> nowhere else. Yeah. Uh, you feel the same way about it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's it's you know it's my home. I, I I've been living in San Diego since uh, sixty one. You know, six years in Los Angeles. And I came to San Diego in, in uh, San or La Mesa in sixty seven and played eight years with the, uh, the pro team there. But yeah, when they talk about home, home, they talk about Fredericton. Yeah. Yeah. And growing up in Fredericton, um, you know, you you mentioned you didn't know you know you broke the color barrier. Did you have any, did it feel, cause you, it's a strange thing. It's like, you know, there's a, a young person of color playing hockey, but then it's like also, but it also makes sense. It was also a kid growing up in Fredericton, of course gonna play hockey. Yeah, yeah, oh God, yeah. I started skating at, at the age of three and I started playing organized hockey at the age of five and you know, just played up, played up through the ranks. And when I was 14, I decided I wanted to become a professional hockey player. And thanks to my older brother, who I had the pleasure of playing with for uh, four or five years before I, you know, before I left Fredericton to go up to uh, Quebec. But I had hockey. Uh, I had hockey in my in my mind. Uh, um, I played baseball, and a lot of people thought I was a better ball player than, than a hockey player. But uh, 
way down deep inside, I mean, uh, I was I was grinding to uh, you know to be the best hockey player I could be, and you know I uh, I left my hometown when I was 17 to go up to uh, Quebec to play my first year junior mm -hmm. uh, with Quebec Frontenacs. Um, Bill Watson was the coach, and Bill played with the New York Rangers back in the back in the 40s and had a good year. And uh, then my second year, I went to Kitchener, Ontario, and and played with the uh, farm team of the Montreal Canadiens. And uh, Jack Stewart was our coach, and you know that's where I had my my accident with being struck in the eye and losing 97% vision in my right eye. Yeah, and that's an amazing 97%. And yet you still continue to play and, and had a successful pro career after. You know, primarily as my dad's teammate. With yes. San Diego goals. Yes. But yes. Uh, so you you so you get struck in the eye, and for a lot of players, that ends their career. That's it. I mean, if you have you lose that any because the, the difference between someone on the ice and someone not on the ice is like three percent. Right. And you lose this this uh, amount of sight, but still are able to persevere. A couple of questions I have about it. First, were you nervous to tell anybody that this was the diagnosis? Well, when the doctor came in and stood by my bedside when I was in the hospital and uh, he said, yeah, Mr. O'Ree, I'm sorry to inform you. He said the impact of the puck completely shattered the retina in your right eye. And he said, you're going to be blind and, and you'll never play hockey again. Well, you know, I was 18 and the two goals that I set for myself is play pro hockey and hopefully one day play in the NHL were gone. So um, I got out of the hospital uh, I was a couple of days later and... Uh, I said to myself, God, what am I, what am I going to do? I just go back to my hometown. But then um, the season wasn't over. So about five weeks, I started, I was back on the ice practicing, playing. And, you know, being a left-hand shot and playing left wing, you know, to compensate, I had to turn my head all the way around to the right to pick the puck up and look over my right shoulder to pick the puck up and pick the play up. And, you know, I was over missing that net and, uh, over missing the puck and I just said Willie forget about what you can't see and concentrate on what you can see because if you looked at me you my, my eye was intact but right I was just blind so the season ends and I um I, co I come back to Fredericton and um, my parents knew that I had been injured and, but when I came back to play they thought that I had recovered from my injury and I never told them that I was blind in my right eye the only person I told was my younger sister Betty and I swore her to secrecy. I said, sis, don't say anything because if they find out that I can't see, um, my, my hockey career is over. Because, see, they didn't take any eye exams back then. When I went to Quebec, you know, once I came home, my junior, my junior career is done. I either have to play pro or, or amateur. When I went to Quebec, they didn't take any eye exams. They were more, more familiar with your, uh, my physical condition. And I worked out and worked out at the gym and played baseball. So I was in, I was in good shape when I went to uh, camp. I was maybe three or four pounds from my playing weight. They never I never sat in front of an eye machine. I just went out and went out and played, played left wing, and uh, we won the you know we won the championship that year. And I said, well, shoot, forget about being blind." He said, "You can do anything you set your mind to do." Yeah. So it, that's the way it just started. I never I never sat in front of an eye machine. For 21 years I played pro hockey. Never sat in front of an eye. Do you think it, were you ever nervous about it that, that this is going to be? <laughs> <laughs> when I went to the Bruins training camp, you know that's the first thing I, I go in there, you know, and uh, you know, so I suit up and go out and practice, and I'm looking around the room, and nobody's in, you know, say, hey, you know, sit in front of this eye machine, you want to see how your vision is. Never did. Yeah. Never did, and I just kept kept on playing, and uh, my sister was the only one I told. Even my my parents had passed on. They thought that I could see. They thought that uh, my vision was good after I came back to play. Wow. They told them I better not tell them because if they found out, you know, then they'd try and convince me to, you know, stop playing. And I just went out, just went out and played year after year, year after year. San Diego, I played uh, seven years, eight years. You won some scoring championships in San Diego. Yeah, 1990, uh, 1995, I won the goal scoring, and then I, I won it in San, in. Um, Los Angeles with the, with the, uh, the LA Blades in, in uh, 19, uh, let's see, I came here in 61 and I won it in 65. Yeah. So you, <laughs> that's, that's incredible. <laughs> One that you kept, you were able to keep that secret because obviously in today's game, 
you know, oh, everything. Okay. Slightly high blood pressure gets reported to the team. Blood pressure, yeah, your, your vision, they check your vision and everything. Yeah, I am. Um, but I, uh, back then, as I said, you know, you just you just played and uh, I, I figured just play as long as you can. You know, if they find out, then you're done. So you mentioned you t- weren't even aware that you were the first black player. And then uh, it happens. And, you know, you, you're, you're playing a bunch in, in front of a bunch of different fan bases. And you're, you're, you're referred to as the Jackie Robinson of hockey. And I think that's, I don't know, that's, I don't know. I don't know how you feel about that label. Well, the, the media, it was the media gave me that name. Of course they did. Because I never, I never said I was the Jackie Robinson of hockey. Who <laughs> would, yeah. I had, you know, I met Jackie Robinson on two occasions, but I never said I'm the Jackie Robinson of hockey. But when they, the media said, yeah, that was Willie. When they brought me up the, you know, the second time to the Bruins, they said, "Oh, there's Willie O'Ree. He's the Jackie Robinson of hockey," and it just stuck with me. And I, I'm, I'm very happy and very, very honored to be in the same category as Mr. Robinson. You know, you are. And Luke, so I keep wanting to go back a couple of levels here. You met Jackie Robinson. Uh, tell me about that because that's that's like he's one of the most iconic figures of the 20th century. I met him. Uh, <clears throat> I met him when I was 14. I was playing baseball in in, in Fredericton, and uh, we won the championship. I played shortstop and second base. We won the championship. The reward was our team was going to be taken to New York to see the Empire State Building, Radio Music City Hall, you know, Coney Island. Saw Mr. Robinson play. After the game, I went down and I met him at the dugout and shook hands with him and told Mr. Robinson that I not only played baseball but I played hockey. And he said I didn't realize there were any black kids playing hockey. I said, yes, Mr. Robinson, there's a few. We had a nice talk and he, you know, I, I was in awe when I, you know, when I met him and then he said, you know, he said, well, um, whatever sport you choose, he said, you know, uh, work hard, you know, there's no substitute for, for hard work. And uh, that, that stuck with me. I was traded to the Los Angeles Blades in 1961. Mm-hmm. From, uh, I was playing in Hull, Ottawa with the Hull, Ottawa Canadians, a farm team of the Montreal Canadians. Came to Los Angeles. In 1962, the NAACP had a luncheon for Mr. Robinson in one of the local hotel or restaurants in, in North Hollywood. I received an invitation through the, uh, through the hockey club. And I went with uh, the coach, uh, two other players and myself, went to the restaurant. Mr. Robinson was standing, giving him media, and we just stood offside waiting for him to finish when he did. The coach came over and said, Mr. Robinson, I'd like to introduce you to three of the local players here, especially Willie O'Ree, who was newly acquired from the uh, Hull of Canadians in the Eastern League. And um, I turned to Mr. Robinson and looked him in the eye and, and he, he, he said, Willie O'Ree, he says, aren't you the young fellow I, I met in Brooklyn? Oh, wow. I met him in 1949 and now I meet him again in 1962. And I, I mean, uh, Zach, it was just, I was in awe that yeah. he remembered me of the Millions of people had admit over the years, he, you know, he singled me out and remembered me. And, he's, and he said, oh, yeah, it looks like you're, you're playing hockey now. And I, I just stood there and a big grin in my face, grin in my face <laughs> shook hands with him. So, yeah, that, that's the two times I had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Robinson. So you play, you know, you have a, a career with the Bruins. And I, I was reading, you know, some of the previous interviews that you had done about your experience in the NHL. And... Uh, Montreal and Toronto definitely were weren't nice to you when you played, but you know, we, as a Bruin, the the you know the no one's gonna be yeah. nice to you in Montreal or, or Toronto. Yeah. Um, but you you said that you had reached um, you had received more cruel remarks in the United States cities, yeah. which it, well, I mean, I I, mean, I I have to know what kind of things were they saying to you? Oh, racial remarks. You know, yeah. not only from the players on the opposition, but fans in the stands. And mm. I knew this was going to happen. You know, my brother, my brother warned me, he said, Willie, he says, you know, he says, if you, if you turn professionally, he says, you're, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be called names. And uh, I know that you're the type of hockey player that um, it's not going to bother you. You just let it go in one ear and out the other. And he said, if people can't accept you for the individual that you are, because you have the skills and the ability to play in the league, you know, at this time. He said, forget about it. This, that, that's their problem, not yours. And, you know, I went and played and I really, I, I really didn't let it bother me. You know, I, I fought a lot when I first went up. You know, I fought because I had to. Guys wanted to see what I was made of. And 
you know, if they didn't drop their stick, I fought with stick. If they dropped their uh, drop their stick, I dropped mine. We fought, and you know, won some, lost some, but I wasn't going to be run out of the league because of you know racial remarks and racial slurs. And it got a little easier, but it took a long time. And I finally gained the respect of not only the fans in the stands, but players on the opposition. And how about players on your own team? Were they were yeah. one, they were going to stick up for you or very supportive? Yeah, all all the teams. I I I, I can't tell you one time that you know that I have any any faults about any of the players that I you know that I played with they were all very supportive and they watched my back and you know uh, that that made me feel good and I you know I could score goals and you know they said hey this guy's a pretty good player he said we you know keep him keep him around I have to ask because you you're I talked to some of my dad's former teammates but you're, you're a special instance. You played with him before he was a Broad Street bully. And I think at that point, he, he was a bit humbled because he was playing amongst NHL greats and for a cup team. But you played with him at the San Diego Goals. He was probably cocky as all hell, <laughs> I bet. I think he had a Corvette at that time, yeah. um, a full head of hair. Yeah. Uh, what you know this is this is where it gets personal for me what tell me about my experience your experience with my dad i i was uh you know when i i i knew i knew of him you know as a hockey you know a hockey player and um i i had seen him play watched him play and when he you know when he came to san diego i mean here's 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 a guy in here that's gonna uh, you know help us win hockey game mm -hmm. and he did um you just you just you had to like him really uh, it was just that type of, he was just that type of an individual. And as far as, uh, you, you know, his ability, shoot, uh, you know, from there he went up, you know, he went up with uh, Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. I was, I was, I was happy and, and, um, and pleased that I had the pleasure of playing with him, you know, and I mentioned, you know, I mentioned, I said, yeah, I played with Oris Kinder. Said, oh, yeah, you did. Yeah. I said, yeah. <laughs> People say that. I love that. Yeah. And um, so, yeah. Uh, he's uh, he's always uh, he's always been a the type of hockey player that you know you had to like you know uh, if you didn't like him you there was something wrong with you. That's what I seem to think. Yeah. One of the one of the things about your you know your your debut as as a hockey player in in Boston is that well you know with Jackie Robinson a couple of years later pretty much everybody has has a, a, you know a black player on their team. Boston again, ironically being the last. Yeah. Um, it took a while for the NHL. I think you you debuted in '58, and Mike Marson finally gets uh, drafted in 1974. That's right. Um, was that something that you were following? Like, okay, hopefully there's another one, or was it like, well, you know, I, knew, I I'm Willie, and this was my career, and you know, whatever I knew comes there next. was going to be other black players or players of color after me because I I, I saw kids that were playing junior. Uh, I saw, uh, I watched guys that were, uh, you know, playing uh, um, pro and, and senior, uh, you know, the, the, the Carnegie's, uh, Herbie and Ozzie Carnegie and Manny McIntyre, the all black line that played in Sherbrooke and um, played in, um, in Los Angeles or, or in, uh, um, up in, up, up in with the Quebec Aces, yeah, with uh, Punch Emlag. And, um, you know, Herbie uh, was by far the better of the, the three players. He went to the, the um, Rangers camp and, uh, you know, uh, he was going to go to the, the Maple Leafs camp. And he could have, he could have been, he could have been the next, uh, he could have been the, the, next, the black player that played before me. He had the skills and the ability, uh, but it just, it just didn't happen. And then, as you mentioned, Mike Morrison came up and, uh, and played for you know, with Washington and then uh, Los Angeles, and then now there's there's a lot you know there's a lot of kids, uh, kids of color and black players that are, that are coming up. And then look at the ones that are playing in the league at the, at this time. Right. Yeah. Um, and I just talked to another Trailblazer because he was the first black uh, hockey Hall of Fame member, which you know you are now. But uh, right. Grant uh, Grant Fear, oh, uh, right. yeah, who you know and. Is a Hall of Fame goaltender, but overcame a lot more than I ever realized he ever did. And um, was that was that some uh, something someone that you kept in contact with? Was like I what I'm what I'm curious about is you knew that you 
you had to know that you were a, a pioneer mm -hmm. and to see uh, other things that you, you know, trailblaze for, how much did you keep in, like keep in, keep tabs on those sort of players in their careers? Well, with Grant, you know, when I, when I came with the NHL in, in 1996, um, and I had the Willie O'Reilly All-Star Weekend for kids um, that were selected from the programs, they'd bring them into a, a host city and, you know, uh, treat them like uh, NHL players. And uh, um, then Grant would, Grant would come uh, as, as a special guest and, and, you know, talk to the Goldies. And uh, I had met him on several occasions. And then, you know, guys like Jerome McGinley, you know, mm -hmm. the player that, that I met. And, you know, the, the nice thing that uh, I remember about um, Jerome is the first time I met him, you know, he says, Mr. O'Ree says, I can't imagine, you know, what you had to go through to make it possible for players like me to play in the NHL. And he says, I, I have the, the highest respect and the highest admiration for you for, for what you did and, um, and what you uh, accomplished and, and uh, your true form of what you wanted, uh, what you wanted to do. Yeah. And when you, when you hear that from, you know, guys that are playing and then making millions of dollars, <laughs> yeah. that, that's the truth. And yeah. I mean, I've heard, I've, heard, I've heard this from a lot of the black players and a lot of the players of color that are in the league. I met, I met uh, a lot of them and they, they told me the same thing, you know, um, and it's nice to hear, you know, Kevin Weeks and, and you know, some of these other players that, that played now that, um, you know, they're, they're working, uh, working in jobs. And, and you, you're now involved in a program that helps, you know, players of color. Not, I mean, obviously you can't just prep players to go to the NHL, but get to the, the similar opportunities that they right. hadn't had before. And, you know, how, how successful do you think that, that that's been? Uh, it's been traditionally, you know, a very, very white sport. And you can sort of, when you look at the sport, you can kind of understand why the origins, I mean, it's, it's Canada and it's uh, Western Europe, predominantly white countries. And then to try to introduce it to, especially a, like a black community, um, how difficult has that been to, to, you know, try to explain, this is a great game and you should play it? Well, you know, first of all, hockey is a very unique sport. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's on ice. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But you can go into a, you know, a gym and, you know, you can dribble a basketball, you can right. uh, throw a football, baseball, kick a soccer ball. But in order to play hockey, you need to get on the ice to develop your skills. There's no, uh, there's no other way. Street hockey is great. You know, roller hockey is great. But in order to play ice hockey, you need to get on the ice to develop your, develop your skills. And, you know, when I first started with the, uh, with the NHL, it was called the NHL's diversity program, which diverse is meant just bringing in kids from all, from all, all colors, uh, all ages to, uh, to play the sport. And now it's called uh, hockey is for everyone. But when I first started, there were uh, five programs throughout North America. Now we've got, uh, we've got probably close to 40 throughout North America. It's kids now that, uh, that are playing uh, in organized, uh, in an organized uh, uh, program. And, uh, you know, we're helping kids, um, you know, just basic bundles of learning the basic bundles of the game, stick handling and passing, keeping your head up and things like this. And some of them that don't have the, I think it's about a hundred, $150 a year, you know, for the programs. And if, if they, if they can't afford it, we'll, we'll make it affordable for them. We'll make sure that any boy, that girl that wants to play hockey, we'll make it happen for them. Now they stay in school, you know, keep their grades up. And it's been great, really. I, I wouldn't have stayed with them for going on 24 years if it, if it hadn't been a good program. You know, and you have to thank, you know, Commissioner Bettman and, um, all, if, and all those that were involved in the program back then. And then now it's just, it's growing. It really is. It, it really is. Kids are watching it um, uh, on television and they're getting to the rinks now and being able to practice and play. And, Hockey's a fun sport. If you're not having fun, don't play it. Pick another sport, you know. It's the best sport. It is. For me. It's just I'm for sure. me, it's I'm the best sure. sport. <laughs> when it comes to hockey, you know, I played baseball. I played I played soccer and, you know, basketball. And I played rugby in high school. And, you know, but uh, come to ice hockey, I, I tell you, it's just something about the sport, getting on the ice and, and being able to do the things you can do on the ice. 
We're speaking the day after the playoffs or two days after the playoffs just started. And the first three games for the first time in NHL history all went to overtime. And oh, overtime hockey is like nothing, nothing else. It's, I, I, I'm sure you still feel the same thrill watching it as you ever oh, did. Yes. And I'm, I'm, I'm so happy now to see some of the fans, more of the fans getting back into the arena. Mm -hmm. You know, Watching it on television is nice, but you've got to be there in the arena. It's the best live experience. I keep telling people that. It, there's nothing like a hockey game live. Bring you to your feet, uh, you know, uh, more more quicker than a, than a hockey game. Uh, Tell me about 2018 when you get inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. Is that something the NHL had talked to you about leading up to it? Or how much did that catch you by surprise or expectations or well, kind of that's what's going to happen? <laughs> It all started, uh, you know, back in my hometown, there was a couple there uh, by the name of Brenda and David Sampson. And um, they, um, there's a, um, a sports writer by the name of Bill Hunt uh, that writes, writes for the Daily Gleaner. And apparently um, they were saying why uh, I thought Willie O'Ree was in the Hall of Fame, you know, for, you know, breaking the color barrier and, you know, being the first black player and so on and so forth. And said, Gosh, he says he should be in the Hall of Fame. So that's how it all started. And then they got together with Brian McBride, who was the um, the vice president of the uh, Hockey for Win program. And they said, God, we've, we've got to see that he gets into the Hall of Fame. He deserves to get in the Hall of Fame. And now they, so they started writing letters, making phone calls, and all of a the submission and it all got, and all of a sudden, you know, they um, they say it's going to happen. Willie O'Ree get in the Hall of Fame. And, the day I'm I'm here in my home, I'm in uh, I'm in my uh, um, kitchen and uh, uh, dining room with my wife, uh, Brian Mc, Brian McBride's there, and uh, I got the call saying um, you'll get a call between twelve noon and three p.m. if you're gonna if you're gonna get into the hall, you'll get a call during that time. So uh, I know Brenda and David uh, Sampson, they were in their home and they invited some friends over. And, and so I'm in, my, uh, I'm in my kitchen and I'm sitting there and I got four phones lined up, you know, and uh, I'm sitting there, <laughs> 12 o'clock comes, I'm looking at the clock, you know, one o'clock comes and two o'clock comes. And then the phone, the phone rings and uh, I, pick, I, uh, uh, I pick up the phone and uh, they said, uh, Willie O'Ree there? I said, yeah, this is Willie. Uh, they said, uh, you know who this is? And uh, I says, no, I says, it's, uh, it's the Hall of Fame calling. And um, we just wanted to, uh, just wanted to let you know um, that you, uh, that you're going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Well, then wow. I, you know, I, I, Brian, Brian, Brian McBride was there, you know, and, and it, it was just great to, to hear. Uh, unbelievable. You know, um, I mean, I was I was in tears and I was overjoyed and uh, overwhelmed, and um, it was just such a such a wonderful feeling. Yeah. And Willie, uh, when you when you close your eyes and crystallize one moment of your career or anything in, in hockey related in your life and just see a, just that image pop up. What do you think that image is? Well, I have two. Okay. Actually, well, the first one was uh, in 1958, uh, you know, when I was called up and stepped on the, uh, the ice in the, the old Montreal Forum and became the first black player to play in the NHL. Uh, the second one was uh, when I scored my first goal uh, in the NHL. It was New Year's night, uh, 1961. Uh, in the old Boston Gardens, we're, we're playing against the uh, Montreal Canadiens. Uh, Jacques Plante's hurt. And so the backup goalie is Charlie Hodge, who's, who's in the net. So I'm warming up before the game starts. And Bronco Horvath, one of my, one of my teammates, uh, comes over and says, hey, Willie, he says, if you ever get in on Hodge, he says, keep the puck low. He says, keep it away from his glove. He's got a good glove. Keep it away from his glove. So we're warming up. Game starts, first period's over the second second period over. We're going into the third period. I think it was my second shift on the ice. I um, I'm playing left wing and I break away from my check. Now I busted down left wing and Leo Boyvin, one of my defensemen, just hits me with a perfect pass. I'm, I got the afterburners on and I don't have to do anything. That I got that stick out. The puck just lays on my stick. 
I go in and I go on in and around the two defensemen. Now I'm going in on hard. I got my head up going in on hard. You know, the next thing I hear is keep it low, keep it low. I go and make a couple of moves on hard. And I either shot the puck just off the ice or it was just on the ice and hit the inside of the post and went in. That made it uh, three to one for the Bruins. You know, the, the, the fans gave me a standing, a two minute standing ovation. Wow. It was great. Uh, about four or five minutes after that, Henri the pocket rocket scores the uh, Canadian second goal, but the goal I scored was the third goal and it turned out to be the winning goal. Wow. It, uh, it was unbelievable. Uh, just to, you know, to play against the Montreal Canadiens again and uh, be on the ice and, and to get the winning goal against them. At know? that moment, you're just a kid from Frederick. <laughs> just a kid from Frederick. Uh, I mean, it was, it, it was a great feeling. I mean, it, uh, you asked me what I had, what I had for breakfast two days ago. I couldn't tell you, but <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you about stories that were 60 years old. Yeah. There's just, I don't know what it is. So what's the other, what's the other memory? Uh, the other memory is just going to the Bruins training camp, you know, yeah. for the first time going to a, an NHL training camp and, and, uh, you know, uh, and meeting Mil, you know, Milt Schmidt. Uh, the coach and, and uh, Glenn Patrick, and, yeah, at that time the GM, the general manager, but um, they just said that Willie, you'll always be a Bruin, and he says uh, the Bruin organization is behind you 100%. That you know that's nice to hear. And yeah, and then when I get the opportunity to go to uh, Boston uh, and there's the game, I always I always go to the game and sit up in the in the, uh, the alumni box. I usually uh, 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 two or three of the players are up there. Johnny Busick there sometimes and have a talk with Johnny. I'm crazy probably for you at that time. I'm no, sitting said, talking to Johnny Busick. I know. Uh, I've had pictures taken with him. I've got a, I got a couple of pictures autographed. And, yeah. yeah. But it, uh, Zach, it really, uh, it really has been a, a, just a, a great career for me, you know, just starting out and, uh, and setting two goals and, and just sticking with it. And, uh, you know, just, trying to be the best hockey player I could be. Yeah. And, uh, taking it a day at a time. And uh, um, I've met some great, I've met some great people, not only hockey players, but I've, I've met some great, some great people over the years. And that's the one thing I miss about not traveling now is uh, the traveling. Yeah. But it's the people. Yeah. The people that I've come in contact with and uh, the stories that we've sat down and uh, just reminisced about. That's well, the one thing. Can't take about can't take away from you is the the memories. I know my my, my dad couldn't speak high, more, high, more highly of you. He, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and Willie, this has been great. I mean, I'm talking to it's such an integral part of, of hockey history, and it's been a, an absolute honor. And um, thank you. <laughs> Glad we finally yeah, made it happen. And uh, and uh, you're in San Diego. You're gonna have a great day. Yeah. We're just know. as close to away, Zach, honestly. You know. It's really, truly, we're really close to each other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, to watch the hockey now, you know, uh, in the in the uh, in the arenas and players are bigger, stronger, better conditioned than I was, but they have the facilities right there. Yeah. You know, I had to go to a, a gym and you know, to work out and then you know, playing baseball. And I tried to keep myself in the best physical condition. You know, over the summer, I'm, you know, I, I, I came to training camp with some guys that were 25, 30 pounds overweight, you know, and trying to lose that, you know, <laughs> they, got the, they got the rubber suits on and, you yeah. know, and I just said, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take that out of the new, I'm going to try and, you know, try and stay in the best possible shape. And when I went to training camp, I was two or three pounds from my playing weight and, you know, first week I was ready to go. My dad says he's still only five pounds away from his playing weight. Willie Ray, it's been a joy. Um, thank you so much for doing this. And um, honestly, congratulations on getting into the Hockey Hall of Fame. It's a, 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 an acknowledgement that you absolutely, is long overdue, but that you absolutely deserve. And Thanks for uh, thanks for speaking to me on this podcast. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, down the road, if you decide, you know, you had a couple of questions that you forgot to ask, give me a shout. Always a part two. 
<laughs> love part twos for sure because i'm always 10 minutes after this I'm like ah why didn't i ask that but yeah, yeah uh, willie have a great afternoon man and, th and thanks again yeah be safe stay well with this you know coronavirus uh, thing that's going on. second it's vaccination in two weeks yeah i am i, yeah. I had my two my wife's had her <laughs> first second one so yeah we're, yeah we're in good shape. We're all right good thanks shape. man You're have welcome. a great afternoon i'll talk to you again soon hopefully yeah you take care zach see you they will. You Thanks.